With the Leaders Library, I ask what book had a massive impact on you and your leadership? And you have given me, I've got it here, <laughs> the first 90 days critical success strategies for new leaders at all levels. And that's by Michael Watkins. So how did that enter your life and what did it do for you? Yeah, so I I found the book when I was searching for books to help starting a new role. I, I was moving into a new role. I had a I had a period of time where I was still in in my previous company. So I had some I had some space between leaving that role and and starting the new one. It had been a long time since I'd started a new company. I'd I'd had changes in role, but I hadn't started within the new company, and I was I was quite worried about that. I was nervous about it, and I wanted to use some time to to give myself some more some more confidence in what I was doing and I was doing my MBA at the time so I was I was reading a lot of material I was absorbing a lot of information but starting somewhere new felt mm -hmm. like a gap and so I I did what most people probably do I looked at Amazon I looked at top 10 books for leadership and top 10 books for changing changing leadership roles and I read the synopsis of it and I felt this this is what I need this is exactly what what I need and and as the title suggests it's not a succinct title but it is a descriptive one it, it it's strategies different things that you can employ and and it really does for me help at, at all levels I, I I've recommended the book I've had people in different roles who've read the book and, and have also highly regarded it and so yeah that was that was how i initially found it so give me an overview so at that time you're doing your mba you're you're saying you've been with your how long were you with your previous company nearly 10 years For nearly 10 years you've changed roles and this is now a shift to company so you're reading this book and what you've got those critical 90 days what do you what is critical in that 90, first 90 days then in starting a new role I think it's probably very dependent on each individual and each each role and and that kind of thing. But that that aside, I think it's really critical to feel like you're prepared, and that means spending some time to understand the organisation, its context, its people, its roles, the role that you're moving into, and what's going to be expected from you. What are, what are your key kind of performance indicators in those first 90 days. I don't remember if I got this from the book or not, but in my mind, I decided that my 90 days was going to start from when I knew I was accepting the role. So I knew that there were things that I needed to do before I started. It may well have been that I did get that from the book, but I I, I felt it was important that my day one I was already walking in with as much of the information, as much of the the knowledge that I felt I needed to make a success of my first day. So already knowing who people are, what their roles are, I did. I I decided very early on that I wanted to meet everyone in the company, and I've maintained that everyone who's started in the company. I haven't yet got to some recent new starters, but. I, I knew that I wanted to meet everyone in the company. I wanted to make it clear what my responsibilities were, what my job was in order to to help them do theirs, and also to break down those initial barriers that can exist, particularly in leadership positions, where other members of the team and the company don't necessarily feel that you're accessible. And I realized, or felt strongly, maybe more than realized, that I never wanted to miss out on an opportunity or understanding or removing a blocker by somebody not knowing or feeling that they could come and talk to me about something and feeling like that that awkward, oh, I don't know them and they're pretty senior and I don't know if they're going to ignore my email or delete my calendar, in, <laughs> whatever it might be. So I started that period prior to starting the actual job. And yeah, so being prepared, thinking about the people, thinking about the relationships that you want, the relationships that you're likely to need or will need you. And um, it's all about gathering that information in advance, but then maintaining it as well. It, it sounds like you've put, even as a CTO, you've put people at the front in your new company. Yes. Yeah. Is that something that's always been important to you? <laughs> No, I don't think so. Is the is the shortest answer. I 
earlier in my career and and as a as a younger person i think i was a lot less interested in the people i felt that i i was the way i was and i was successful and being successful in the way that i was and therefore i must have been doing something right and if if I left a wake of some description, not as harsh as this, I didn't, I didn't think in those terms, but looking back now, it was a case of if that didn't work for other people, then so be it. And, and I was going to carry on regardless. That's definitely not how I've thought for several years, probably five years anymore, but being entirely open, I was, I was a lot more self-centered maybe arrogant maybe maybe certainly and and it, that's a huge change a, like a, a complete turnaround i put people and relationships both at home and at work in front of anything tangible anything physical then i honestly think that people are what makes an organization or breaks an organization and and as i say that organization might be at home you know family unit mm. uh, you know whatever whatever it might be it, it really is we we are people and it's interesting you say as a cto a lot of people think that those involved in in technology are less perhaps comfortable or keen on the relationship side of things um I, it may be a it may be a modern change, it may be a trend, but I certainly have some of the best relationships that I have, including my best friend in technology, and and really do prize highly prize their relationships and uh, with people at work and at home and put their people first, which I I personally I think is is great. I think it's it's absolutely the way forward. We we are people. There may be a day where machines can do everything for us, but we're still going to need to interact with each other. And we're still going to need to design for each other those those systems and technologies. So yeah, I prize it highly. It's interesting. There is this view sometimes of, of technical people and 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 how they deal with personal relationships. It's almost like that big bang theory kind of like everyone's gonna be a geek. <laughs> the Sheldon. Yeah, yeah, the Sheldons or the, you know. And of course, yeah, we all have, have bits of that. But you know, technology is also it's about language. And it's about creating things that work and connect with each other and are understood by different interfaces. So in that sense, I think there's a lot to, if you learn about code and you learn about also how things connect together, then that different from how people connect. Well, I think <laughs> on a more, a more basic level as well, I'm sure it happens, I'm sure it exists, so I'm not saying that it doesn't, but I think it's it's probably the rarity that somebody, an individual, comes up with an idea to solve a problem that doesn't involve people, is able to turn that idea into something physical without people, doesn't need to collaborate with anyone, doesn't need to test with anyone, doesn't need anyone's permission or discussion to release, doesn't need to get a customer to use that, and doesn't need to get them engaged with it and to, and to continue using it. If that exists, I'd quite like to know about it, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'd be very surprised. Um, yeah. And if it does exist, I'm, I can't imagine it's very successful. Uh, so that for me, you know, the, all of those touch points involve people needing help from others, needing to help others, or or looking to get others to consume or use something. And and on that basis, it, it, technology is a is a people industry. So technology is a people industry, which is a fantastic. Uh, as you say, it's a thing to say. And, and and of course, a lot of technology is thought with that user experience in mind and, and how we connect with other people and, and also the psychology just in terms of, of how we do, what those touch points are, where they are and, and understanding behavior. But I want to I want to drag you back a second because you dropped a bombshell in the fact that now this is who you are. And yeah. this is the journey. But, but let's have a look at that journey because you said before there was potentially an element of arrogance you were great you were successful what happened there that's a really good question i don't i don't know if there was a single realization moment there might have been there were certainly there were certainly some in my personal life which which made me think about my 
impact on others. I do remember a, a previous boss using the phrase that I use now, and, and I'm sure I'll use it in, in this conversation, which is about that elder states person was how they described it and nuanced leader and i i use those phrases quite a lot and and owe the the credit to that person because i started to consider the people that i really really rated and would consider myself a success if i were in their position with their abilities and capabilities and I considered what were the things that made them different. So if we think back about, you know, who was who was the boss that we loved working for the most? Who was the person who seemed to get the most done with people who were pleased to do it? And I and then I considered my own experiences and from my own perspectives, a single look out from myself out out to others. I was thinking I was very successful, but then I considered what would happen if I or someone else, maybe even better, if someone else asked them what they thought of me and how much they enjoyed or took from the work that they did and how I how I gave that work, for want of a better description, you know, how I sold the story to them and how I brought them along for the ride. And I think I was great at the time pulling people along, but I don't think I was great at selling the story and getting having those people want to be on that ride and a part of that of, of that journey and i realized that i was quite away from where i wanted to be and there was quite a difference in that you say you think that people didn't want to be on that journey whatever what were you seeing that was giving you that thought I don't think that the people that I was working with seemed happy in what they were doing. I didn't know they weren't happy. I didn't know that they didn't want to be on on that journey. But I didn't feel that there were obvious signs that they did and they were. Mm -hmm. And for me, that now I think about that differently because I'm talking about a, a, a point in time that was what I thought. Now, actually, I have, even if I was making those same observations, I would also be thinking about the fact everybody's different. Everybody processes differently. Everybody has different levels of energy, enthusiasm, how introverted or extroverted, where they get their energy from, those sorts of things. But at the time, I, I I felt like I was potentially doing something wrong. And what I didn't necessarily want to do was shift everything that I was doing. But what I did want to do was to understand more about those people and what drives them and, and what they do get excited about and, and whether they do get excited about those things and be able to flex that nuanced leader, be able to consider and provide the things that motivate those people excite those people and and potentially get the best of those people in a way that they feel is meaningful to them and that was the difference i before it was this is what i want to do this is what i want to achieve this is what we're going to do and i was I, I think i was always we're in this together i was once on a major incident for over 20 hours i was there with the team despite the fact that I wasn't the one needing to resolve that that issue directly. Because it was always a case if if I'm asking you to to do something, I'll I'll do it with you. So I think I think in that respect it wasn't dictatorial or anything, mm -hmm. but it was definitely from my own perspective. This is what this is what I need to do and what I need to achieve. I'm excited by this. So I'm sure you are too. It, it does become quite transactional. Whereas yes, for delivery, delivery of change, that kind of thing, then there's definitely much more place for making sure that you're self-aware and aware of others and your impact on others. I hear I hear the word impact a lot at the moment, and, and particularly in positive terms. Mm -hmm. The impact that you have within a company, your your ability to to understand and generate impact for your customers. But that is a 
it's a two-way word and that that wake that can be left behind you can be a positive one or it can be choppy seas and making sure that you're aware of that and considering it when you're when you're dealing with people i think is very important so it's interesting sounds like you are seeing a replication of that that journey of self-awareness that you yourself have been on and and we do see this, of course, because it's experience as a leader. We go through being and, and you have to work hard, you know, in the early stages of a career, you have to pedal, you have to work hard. And, and as you said, you were successful. And and then there's a shift where it's just, it almost becomes less transactional, but more about the fact I've got to bring all these people together. And and he's to say this was a slow, so there wasn't one boom, oh my gosh, if I don't have people on board then everything's going to be a disaster. But it was a slow, steady awareness that you were going, oh, people aren't happy. And, and when you said that, what it made me think of was net promoter school, mm -hmm. so the NPS, and, mm -hmm. and that, that psychology of like, if it's anything below a nine, then people are kind of like, mm, yeah. well, I, I wouldn't recommend people probably work here, but, you know, we are like... You, you need something to be a hell yeah. Would like people that. be shouting from the rooftop about you kind of thing? And it's not about that from a from a narcissistic perspective. I think it's about if you really want to, if, if you take it back to transactional, if you want to be very successful in a transactional sense or hitting particular goals or objectives, actually how much more successful that is if you, if you have your people on board and if your people will 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 follow you and sometimes it might need to be we just need to do this but if they trust you if they trust that at every opportunity and all the discussions that haven't needed to be like that that you have understood them done what's best for them they trust you they 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 understand what what is driving you and where some of these things might come from if you do need to say just do it then that trust is there and people say we we understand that you've you've and, done the groundwork you've done the groundwork yes yes yeah. um and and you're absolutely right it it wasn't i needed to go from point a to point b and i'm just going to take a jump there there's a an aviation term i actually heard it the first time when i was in the scouts as a kid which is called the the one in 60 rule and it's that every every single degree of course that you are over a distance of of 60 nautical miles you will be one nautical mile off course so that 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 gap becomes wider that's kind of seen as a negative thing obviously because you're going to be off course it's not where you want to not where you planned to be necessarily and i i've kind of thought that i've thought of it more as my trajectory i will end up in a particular place which is not necessarily where i would like to be and therefore, instead of trying to make a huge leap, if I make a series of smaller one degree adjustments, my over my period of time where I would have ended up and my new direction will be quite different. And that's certainly held true. Where do you want to end up? <laughs> I honestly don't know. And I like that. So I, I have a plan. I know what my next steps are. I know what I would like to be doing next, the kind of roles, the kind of companies, the, the ethos and cultures. I, I know all of that. doesn't mean it will happen, but they're, they're, they're kind of what, I, what I'm aiming for. But in terms of a destination, I don't have or think I want a destination. What I would like to do is continue considering what I'm doing now, what I would like to be next, and, and perhaps the step after that as well. So it's not necessarily just, just one step. But I, if I have a thing that I want to get to, and I, and I always use the phrase, a, a dream, there, there are, there, I have dreams, there are things that I would love to, to have or do. I don't necessarily want that thing. I want it to always be just out of reach because that's, that, that's what drives me to consider what I'm doing, what I'm doing next, and to aim like a moonshot you know to, to aim for the moon and i will get as far as as i can along that along that way um and can to I use ask, a cliche yeah sorry yeah, God. when you say a thing 
Can we, uh, what kind, can you give us an example? What kind <laughs> of things, what kind of things are these moonshots? Okay, I will confess. <laughs> <laughs> and my, and my, my wife will laugh at this, I'm sure. So I have for a very long time had a dream of owning a Porsche and a very particular Porsche. It's, you know, it's, it, it's something that I would love to own. I would love to have and, and dream of often look at pictures, send them between my best friend and I, uh, who, who has a Porsche and had a Porsche previously. And, um, we had the opportunity for my 40th birthday and before we were doing some, some other things, my wife sort of said, you know, 40th birthday, you know, kind of time that maybe you could consider that kind of, that kind of thing. And it, and it's not incredibly expensive. So I don't, I, I wouldn't want anyone to think that, that <laughs> it's something like that. It, it's achievable. And I said, no, I don't want to, I, I kind of, I wouldn't know then what to, I don't think I would enjoy the necessarily the the ownership as much as I enjoy thinking about it. And what do you do then? You've you've achieved, you've ticked the box. And I think you might always or would be at risk of never being happy by mm -hmm. potentially moving on to the next thing, being disappointed that your dream hasn't lived up to the reality. And I think about that in the terms of my career, my personal life as well. I'd like to aim for the best that I can be because if I get to a particular target and, and think that's my, my potential, it's probably like winning the lottery. That is great and it's wonderful and it probably brings a lot of unhappiness with it as well because – you can buy anything you want. You can do anything you want, you know, and, and, and in your in your career, you've achieved, you've done. Everyone looks at you or you, yourself in your own mind and say, I've done this. And then what? That's what that's what doesn't excite me. It sounds like almost that the, that pursuit, that traveling of and the enjoyment of. But it, it does make me wonder because, of course, when we can be goal driven and and you are goal driven and at work, you've achieved many goals. Do you ever take that time to stop and enjoy it? Or does it always feel a little bit like when you get there? Oh, um, it's not I think it's an incredibly good observation. And if I am self-critical, which, which I can be, if I if I. I probably don't acknowledge the achievements and successes that I have had as much as I probably should, or maybe cause should is like, according to who, yeah. but I probably don't as much as I would benefit from. And I think it is something that I do try to think about. And I'm reminded of it because it's not my natural way. I forget about it until a conversation like this or when I'm saying something similar to someone else because I'm I'm a lot better at observing that and acknowledging other people's achievements and successes. So I would certainly take that comment or suggestion on the chin. I think it's I think it's fair and I think to be to be better one of the things that I should do is to acknowledge well, actually, when I look back on my my career and the things that I have achieved, um, and I have achieved with all of those people around me, what we've mm -hmm. achieved collectively has there's there's been some really really great stuff in there. But I think that that part of that comes from age, experience, as you say, less arrogance. You can you can consider. I used to discount my successes as if I did celebrate them, that that was perhaps feeding into that arrogance. But I think your motivation is the biggest differential in that in that scenario where there are there are good things to celebrate and there are good reasons to celebrate things that you've overcome, achieved, avoided, whatever it might be. And uh, and yes, that's something that on a personal level, I think. I could do better at. 
that's a part of being on that journey to and enjoying the journey is something that a lot of people forget to do. They can be so focused on the goal and then they get to the goal and it's almost like they've stopped and gone, oh, but equally they didn't take that time. And it sounds like you really do enjoy the process, that pursuit of, of potential. So tell me a bit about what you do in terms of what what shifts in your mindset you've had to really become you with that successful guy <laughs> right at the beginning and along the way this this journey of being really open to who you are and watching people so what what tools or techniques really led you there and what do you still actively do today as a leader for your team and for you I think the biggest thing is probably one of the one of the oldest management leadership books or or you could put it in that category that I've read, which was the How to Win Friends and Influence People, which I'm sure is in your library. And if it's if it's not, I'll change it and add that one in there as well. <laughs> because there there's a phrase in there, and I, again I might not quote it directly but be genuinely interested in people. And I think if you if you really are interested in people, that, that doesn't necessarily just mean you're interested in what kind of house they've got and what books they read and, and that kind of thing. But actually, more almost more importantly, you're interested in what motivates them, in what excites them, what scares them, what things would they like to change or, or help or improve and what tools and experience and and support you can offer to help with that. And I, I genuinely think that if you are interested in people, you will achieve a lot, regardless of what you're trying to achieve. And you might not achieve the thing you're trying to achieve, but you will be achieving something. Whereas if you try to achieve a at a task or a particular outcome only you're definitely not going to get as far or in a way that like i said before brings people along for the ride and i I say that a lot i say it at work and and at home like yes as a leader you are leading one that is leading but if there's no one with you then it's kind of it's a it's a lonely leadership (laughs) and i'm not sure you can really be leading Nobody. In terms of tools, talking to people, understanding people, or asking questions, you know, trying to understand people. I wouldn't profess to say I understand the people that that I'm referring to, but I certainly try. And I certainly spend that time meeting with them on a group level, on a one-to-one level, talking about personal things, talking about work things, and explaining the context of whatever it is we are trying to achieve. And I think that's something as well. I certainly would explain well where we needed to get to. But I think I used to spend more time explaining how I wanted it to be done. And certainly a a tool or, or knowledge that I've gained over the last decade has been how much more important it is to describe the outcome we're trying to achieve, the context of that outcome, why we're trying to to do it. And then letting the best people for that particular goal or objective decide the best way to get there. Because what I was doing was telling them how I would do it. And therefore, in my mind, what is the best way of achieving it? That may have been the best way for me to achieve it. But that individual who's a different person with different experiences, different different methods, different brain entirely, may have a better way of them achieving it. And I'm one person. At one point, I had a hundred, a hundred technologists onshore, offshore, outsource, and I was, I was, that was for for one program of work. I absolutely couldn't achieve the amount of work that they could achieve in the way that they could achieve it. So the best way was to get out of their way, you know, give them, give them whatever the boundaries were, and let them be successful. And I was a lot more successful as a as a result. A lot of leaders struggle with actually not telling people how to do and of course your your experience is highly valuable and you are the senior leader but as you say you versus a hive of 100 minds with 100 ways of thinking about things um 
it takes a lot to be able to facilitate, as you say, that, that ability to get out of their way and trust. But, but equally, painting that really clear picture of the outcome is often a great way instead of not, right, this is this is what we need and this is how to do it. Really sitting and painting that picture in someone else's mind. This is, how, you know, what, this is, I want to put a better phrase, you know, of course, for what it looks like, this is what it will do. I mean, that, doing that is not only putting it in their minds and giving them ownership and accountability about what it is instead of keeping them on the outside on just their little bit of it, but it's also helping them see the wider picture. But when someone has a wider picture about their impact, as you're saying, the words, their their wider impact, and the fact that actually we do impact one another positively or negatively. I mean, do you feel that that is also something, having that wider picture is something that really brings together a team? It's really, really interesting over more recent history where, do I think that? Yes. But I have also encountered and worked with absolutely some of the best people in their field that I've ever worked with who don't want that wider context. They want to know in more detail what, where, how, who, to, to I'll say minute, because minute from my perspective, but from, from their perspective, that's the level of detail that they want and need to feel comfortable that what they're going to do is well understood and that they will be more confident in what it is they're they're trying to achieve. And they don't want to know what's on either side of that because and what they're doing is so detailed and what they're doing is so complicated and part of a complex problem or environment or whatever it is, it is where there are things that are outside of their control as well, that looking too widely means that they can't focus on that level of detail. Mm. And that's that's really been an, another learning experience for me to to when I said I want to understand what people need, how they work, what what excites them, etc. Part of that has been learning what it means when you are in that that mindset and in that environment and and that is your role to for me to consider that in in what I am explaining and not give them superfluous information from from their perspective. So looking at who you are and who you are as a leader, what impact do you really want to make? I got into the earliest part of my leadership experience in team leader and then into into management roles and i was i was asked very early on what my reason was for that why why did i want to become a manager director etc and my answer was to to give other people the best chance they have of succeeding in what they would like to succeed in. And it's interesting because thinking back to that point now, it's fairly evident to me that I was a lot more interested in other people than I probably gave myself credit for in, in the intervening kind of years. But that was my reason. And I think that I think that still holds as true today as it did then. And enabling success, whether that's of a product, of a customer, of the team, of an individual, that really is what I would like to continue to to have as my kind of raison d'etre or my my what what drives me to to do the things that I do. So yeah, I think using my skills and knowledge and experience to enable the success of others and be the be the catalyst for that or certainly a a, a prompt or an enabler or or whatever you would like to call it that that underpins what everything that i do 
So I've got one last question for you. When I asked you your details, you put in the fact that you were a, a recovery and rescue diver. <laughs> <laughs> well, <What? laughs> I am. I am qualified in that. Oh, qualified. Yes. In that, yeah. So I love diving. I absolutely love diving and have not done it for several years. And it, it, it does great with me that, that I haven't been able to. But yes, I did. I did several qualifications in diving. And one of those, I, I, I loved it. I did underwater photography, shark anatomy and physiology. And one of them that I did was, was recovery and rescue diver, which, which I actually used, needed the day after, I think it was, I qualified where somebody else on a diver, an inexperienced diver panicked and decided to inflate their BCD, their, their buoyancy device and, um, were shooting up to the surface, kind of lost control gas expands as you get nearer the surface. So they were going faster and faster. And I had a great instructor an absolutely brilliant instructor when I did my course. And he said to me this, I'm going to make this really tough on you. And he did. I had one day I'd blood all down my leg. I, he was fighting me, taking my mask off, my regulator out, I was bubbles everywhere, drowning basically. Um, but it was absolutely brilliant because I knew exactly what to do. I knew exactly how to take charge dragged that person back down emptied their bcd and calmed them down which was the which was the biggest problem so yeah i and i think i definitely there's definitely lessons from that that i have employed in work and home like sometimes you just need to do something sometimes you just need to calm someone down sometimes there's a, a combination that's required but being able to assess that, being being having the experience behind you that means you you can feel confident in in what you're doing it is a huge a huge win definitely. That's amazing and and what an experience to have and terrifying as well because it, you know day to day you're not dealing with someone's life underwater and that's a real I mean leadership in the extreme of making sure someone is is not going to you know. Die. Thankfully, um, I don't work in an industry where that's a, where that's a thing. But but actually, there's there's all sorts of parallels, isn't there? If you if you if you ignore ignore it as a death, but make make a significant mistake, you know. So to say, and I have had that. I have had people come to me and say, "I'm really sorry. I've done this, and I didn't realize, and it was that." And that, and the first thing is, it's okay. W whatever it is, we can solve it taught me through it what what happened and if you can if you can have that that elder states person response if it's not an overt loud emotional what the hell did you do that for kind of thing like you're going to be in a better position to solve it resolve it and avoid it in the future the the psychological safety conversation there in terms of someone having the yeah. the safety to know they can come and tell you when something's wrong. It comes down to trust again, doesn't it? I've said this before, uh, the story that I saw on LinkedIn a few months ago, Airbus A380 pilot flying across the Atlantic, 800 kilometers an hour, 30,000 feet, when a Eurofighter appears next to him and, and the jet pilot slows down, makes it obvious he's slowing down alongside the, the Airbus and sort of says, Hi, a bit boring on an Airbus, isn't it? And he says, have a look here, you know, rolls over, barrel rolls, loop the loops, flying down to the sea and back up again and says, how was that? And the Airbus pilot says, oh, very, very impressive, but you watch this. And the jet pilot's there for 10, 15 minutes. Nothing's happening. The Airbus is straight and level. And uh, the Airbus pilot comes back and says, what do you think of that? <laughs> and the jet pilot says, I don't know, what do you mean? What did you do? And the Airbus pilot just sort of laughs and says, I got up, stretched my legs, went to the went to the air, back of the aircraft, used the bathroom, got a cup of coffee, talked to the cabin crew, gave me a Danish or whatever. And I think that that realization that when you're young, that kind of speed, adrenaline, outwardness all seem to be great. And they get you very far. You know, you might become a jet pilot. Great. But as you get older and wiser, you realize that kind of that that hubris can hold you back from reaching 
the serenity, the pleasure that comes from inner confidence, true confidence, not not outward confidence necessarily, but being comfortable in yourself and that that elder statesman and nuanced leader that enables what I think success feels like for me. I don't panic. I'm not trying to prove. And that enables me to do a much better job. On that note, that is a fabulous, fabulous place to wrap up. And it's been an incredible chat. And I can imagine that, you know, you're someone who can definitely steer a ship calmly and go back and get a coffee when needs to. Anyway, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story of, of who you are, how you approach leadership. And thank you so much. If we, we need to connect with you, where, where can we find you? On LinkedIn is probably the, the easiest place. Yeah. So Lewis Cameron on LinkedIn and Lewis Cameron UK, I think is the is the short link. And yeah, I'd love that. And, and thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure i i know i told you this before but this is the first time that that i have done podcast so it, it, it's been a great experience and you've made that thank you